Water can be a powerful force, and flooding is a natural process. Here in British Columbia, melting snow raises rivers every spring, and sea level rise can bring coastal floods. When communities, governments, and businesses develop and use lands that are subject to flooding, this increases the risks and the consequences when the waters rise. In extreme cases, flooding can damage or destroy entire communities. To plan and be prepared for floods, we need to understand how water moves. That's why a new computer model has been developed as part of a lower mainland flood management strategy planning process. On the Fraser River, we can anticipate some fairly extreme flows. Um, and the design flow that is used is what's called a one in 500 year. So a, a, a flood that has a one in 500 chance of occurrence in any given year occurring. And the flow that we designed for is 16,500 cubic meters per second on the Fraser River. And by the year 2050, we anticipate a 16% increase to that peak flow. And by the year 2100, a 39% increase to the peak flow. Most of the dikes in the lower mainland were built in the 70s and the 80s, and they were built to the standard at the time. And this unfortunately did not include for such things as earthquake impacts or climate change impacts. The floodplain model and associated flood maps are intended to inform policies and actions to reduce the impacts of floods. These include diking, land use planning, and emergency planning. The Fraser River has flooded many times in the past. The biggest flood of written record occurred in the spring of 1894. Today, a flood of that magnitude would cause widespread disruption and displacement of residents. If flood protection dikes failed, the damage to buildings, agriculture, and infrastructure could add up to 20 or 30 billion dollars. That would make it the costliest disaster in Canadian history. Five to six times more costly than the floods in southern Alberta in 2013. The social, cultural, health and environmental impacts would be immeasurable. A large coastal flood could cause similar damage in coastal parts of the Lower Mainland. Large floods are beyond the capabilities of any one community or agency, and the impacts would be felt all across the region. That's why more than 50 partners have come together to develop the Lower Mainland Flood Management Strategy. They include federal, provincial and local governments, First Nations, and the private sector, with support from the nonprofit Fraser Basin Council. The goal is to work together to reduce flood risks across the region. Floods cannot be entirely prevented, but with planning, the risks can be managed and negative impacts can be minimized. To be effective, a regional flood strategy for the Lower Mainland will need to have broad support from all levels of government and other partners across the region. That will require agreement and alignment on some key questions. For example, where are the most important opportunities to reduce flood risk? What options and approaches make the most sense for the Lower Mainland region? And how can all jurisdictions work together to fund and implement the flood strategy? The fact is, BC is not facing this challenge alone. Coastal and riverside communities around the world face increased flood risks because of climate change and continued development in floodplains. We can draw on expertise from other jurisdictions, as well as traditional knowledge here in the Lower Mainland. Luckily, we have many tools available to support us to reduce our risk to flooding. Some of them include flood protection infrastructure, like dikes, like we have in place today, but also include things like our land use decisions and planning, how we build on these on the floodplains, and in terms of actually having a flood event, how we um, respond and recover during that emergency event. We have a whole suite of tools. The challenge at this point is to figure out how we're gonna make decisions about what to use. And to do that, we really need to understand our shared priorities and values. Examples of these values include human safety and vulnerable populations, including First Nations communities that have little or no flood protection, critical infrastructure and essential services, ecosystems, including fish and wildlife habitat, agriculture and food security, and private property, including homes and businesses. 
The goal is to balance these values while identifying regional priorities. Those priorities inform the policies and actions we choose to reduce risks from flooding. Local governments, First Nations and others can implement measures to reduce risk before a flood. For example, land use planning, zoning or building codes. These regulations can encourage building designs and land uses that are resilient to flooding, such as parks, recreation and natural ecosystems, while shifting high-cost developments and critical infrastructure outside of floodplains. This can be a tough choice for local governments because the same land is often attractive to developers. Flood risk reduction has to be taken into consideration alongside community development, economic opportunities, and physical constraints on usable land. Ground floors can be used for parking and designed to withstand flooding. Critical equipment, such as electrical and mechanical equipment, can be located at higher elevations. Similarly, hazardous materials and pollutants should be stored above predicted flood levels. There may also be potential to build homes and businesses to withstand damage, either with flood-resistant building materials or architectural designs that allow floodwaters to flow through. This can come with additional upfront costs and may require changes to building regulations. But overall, zoning measures and updated construction standards are worth considering alongside other flood protection mechanisms. When river or ocean levels rise, well-designed flood infrastructure can prevent large-scale destruction. When the Fraser River flooded in 1948, several dikes failed. This led to upgrades for flood protection infrastructure in many lower mainland communities during the 1970s and 80s. So one of the most recognizable forms of flood protection that we have in the lower mainland is our dikes. We have over 600 kilometers of dikes that separate the communities from the Fraser River as well as our coastal areas. In recent decades, these dikes, floodgates and pump stations have succeeded in holding back high water and reducing flood damages. But our current diking system has yet to face a flood like the one in 1948, or the larger Fraser River flood in 1894. Dike upgrades need to be considered, along with other structural and non-structural measures. An alternative to traditional dikes is to look at super dikes or setback dikes that communities are considering. Super dikes, as being designed for global coastal communities, are higher, wider and more expensive than traditional dikes, and intended to be more resistant to failure and resilient to seismic activity. In the case of a river flood, setback dikes leave more room in the river channel for water to flow. In some cases, this can reduce overall flood height. With setback dikes, flood-resilient land uses can continue along the shoreline, while buildings and other high-value assets are protected behind the dike. The challenge with, with these dike alignments and dike widths is that they require more land for the dike footprint and may require moving of buildings or homes to allow for more space uh, for these dike alignments. Seawalls are a form of infrastructure that may be more feasible than dikes, where there's limited space and that may help reduce risk of erosion in some locations. Physical flood barriers are important ways to protect against floods, but they can't guarantee against flooding. Dikes can be overtopped, and they may also fail through other mechanisms such as erosion or collapsing when they're saturated. Seawalls and natural shorelines can also be overtopped, especially when they're exposed to large waves and high winds. Some jurisdictions are experimenting with more natural engineered shorelines to help reduce wave energy and reduce erosion while maintaining shoreline habitat. In some jurisdictions, such as Manitoba, diversion channels have been built to direct flood water away from high-risk areas. For BC's Lower Mainland, one option might be to use existing hydro reservoirs to store water in periods of elevated flood potential. This has been done in the past using the Nechaco and Bridge River reservoirs, which drain into the Fraser. There are some opportunities um, to divert some water in the upper watershed that would reduce the volume of water coming into the Fraser River during a flood. This doesn't offer um, an, a total solution because it has a lot of ecological um, impacts, 
um, and wouldn't be able to reduce all of the flooding. However, it does offer an opportunity to uh, change the design heights, for example, of the dikes because we have less water coming down the Fraser River. Sediment removal has the potential to reduce water levels in some areas. However, flood modeling to date suggests that even large-scale dredging would have relatively little effect on floodwater levels. One thing that was looked at was sediment removal around Chilliwack and Agassiz, so removing some of the sediment from the river to theoretically accommodate more water and reduce the water level. The models show, show that this had limited benefits in terms of the overall water profile. So it is potentially a tool that could be used very locally, but it's certainly not a silver bullet in terms of reducing the water levels and the flood hazard in the region. In the lower Fraser River, there are concerns that removing gravel could destabilize the river channel, with negative consequences for salmon, sturgeon, and fish habitat. No matter how prepared a community is, in a major flood, many things will be out of our control. Even with updated flood protection infrastructure and proactive measures to reduce flood risk, there's still a need for emergency preparedness, planning, response, and recovery. Local and First Nations governments are on the front lines of making plans and preparations for their communities in advance of a flood. When a flood event begins to impact more than one community, provincial planning and response resources are triggered. Preparedness and response activities include shoring up existing measures, such as raising low spots in dikes, deployment of temporary works such as sandbags, and other temporary measures. And if necessary, evacuating neighborhoods. The last line of defense is flood recovery, including cleanup and rebuilding after a flood. In recent years, overland flood insurance has become available in Canada. Disaster financial assistance may also be available from senior governments to help homeowners, small business owners, and local governments to repair and rebuild. Depending on insurance coverage and eligibility for disaster assistance, Individuals, households, and businesses may have additional recovery costs. Insurance coverage and disaster assistance policy has changed substantially in the past six years. Homeowners and businesses in floodplain areas should look into whether they can obtain overland flood insurance for their properties. Disaster financial assistance may not be available to those who can gain protection through private insurance. Partners in the Lower Mainland Flood Management Strategy are working to set regional priorities and ensure there is funding available to implement the overall plan once complete. So one of the challenges we have with flood is that water knows no boundaries. And so it's incredibly important when we think about water is making sure that we're not pushing water to our neighbor or making a decision that's going to make risk worse for another community. The key ingredient really is that the, the province and uh, with uh, federal government support drive the process and one way that they could help flood management, particularly in the Lower Fraser, is to provide support to each local government for them to develop a unique, integrated, comprehensive flood management plan. A number of Lower Mainland local governments are actively updating and implementing local flood plans and others are likely to follow suit though the size of the investment for region-wide flood risk reduction is significant. The Lower Mainland Flood Management Strategy is intended to complement these local efforts, strengthen collaboration, explore priorities for investment, and review funding options. Many of the 50-plus partners in the Lower Mainland Flood Management Strategy are public agencies and local governments. So before finalizing a regional flood plan, it's appropriate to seek input from the public. Together we can build a flood management strategy that brings communities together and reduces the impacts of future floods. It's taken years of work to build trust, share knowledge, and seek consensus. Now we have a range of land use planning and infrastructure options under evaluation in terms of what is likely to work best in the Lower Mainland. It will be up to governments and partner organizations with input from the public and stakeholders to finalize the plan and ultimately put it into action. Mm -hmm.